Welcome back. Within algorithm design and computer science, understanding time complexities and the big O notation is fundamental. This notation provides a high level understanding of an algorithm's efficiency, giving insights into how execution time will change as the size of an input increases. So while there are numerous complexities to consider, we're going to be looking at the most common ones. So let's start off with ON linear runtime. So what linear runtime represents is as the input size scales, the time will also increase in a linear fashion, providing us with this linear line right here. So let's look at an example. We have the function increment values, takes in an array and the array is specified as an argument down here. So the first step we do is declare a constant increment value, which is one. This is going to be constant time because an integer in JavaScript is usually 64 bits or eight bytes of memory. Therefore it's negligible. Then all we do is loop through the array. We're looping through each value within this array. And then we're updating each value within the array by one. Finally, we're returning the array, which is constant as well. So the only operation that takes up a significant portion of time is this one, and it's going to be O n. So this is going to be a linear time, and n in this case is going to be the length of the array that we're passing in. So as this array increases or it scales, the time taken for this function to process is going to scale linearly with that. So if this is doubled, say we have 12 values, we're gonna to have to iterate through 12 values and update all of these by one. If this is increased to a million, this is also going to have to iterate over a million values within the array. So it's a linear process. Simple, right? So that's the time complexity of this algorithm. Let's also look at the space. Like we said, increment value is an integer. So in terms of size, that is negligible, right? Always going to be 64 bits. This isn't going to increase as the size of the input array increases. With the for loop, we're looping through the array. We're adding up the values. We're incrementing each value in the array by one. This isn't taking up any extra space because this array is already passed in as an argument. So when we return this, space in this case is going to be O of 1, constant. It doesn't increase when the input size is increased. So to conclude for this algorithm, time complexity is O n and space complexity is O 1, which we're going to look into now. So here is O 1. This is what we call constant time because as the input size increases, the time taken for an algorithm does not increase. So it does not scale with the input size. So it is said to be constant. So let's look at some of the most common runtimes that are constant. So the first one we're gonna look at is let x equal five. So we're declaring a variable here. Now, if we have an algorithm and within this algorithm, we declare a variable, this is always going to remain constant. We know every time the function runs, this assignment occurs once. So this is O1. Another one, say we have an array and we access a value within that array. Now we will go into more depth into arrays in the coming videos, but accessing a value within an array at a particular index is also going to be constant time. And the reason for this is accessing an array by an index is a direct memory access. So what I mean by that is we can access any value within this array by its index because this is stored in space as a contiguous array. So each one of these integers are stored next to each other in memory. So very fast, very optimal, this is constant time. Another constant operation is simple arithmetic. Anything that includes multiple application, addition, division are constant operations because they don't depend on any input size. O1. Logging out information is also considered O1 because the time it takes to print a static message doesn't change. O1. Let's say we have an object containing name and age properties and then person name is equal to object and we are just going to access the property of name. Well, accessing a property in an object using a key is a direct memory access and doesn't depend on the size of the object. So this is also constant. If we have a function return constant and we return 42, then we call this function return constant and pass this into a variable. This is also considered O1, right? Because again, nothing here scales as an input increases, right? We are only returning an integer. Lastly, say we have a loop where we're living from i is equal to zero, i is less than five, increment i, and we just log out I. Now you might think because this is a loop, this will be O n, so it'll be linear operation. But because we are looping through a fixed number of times, this will always be the same. So we are always, no matter what, going to be looping through this five times. So that can be considered constant. Next up is log n time complexity. So say we have the question, find target T within the sorted array. So we have a target which is equal to one. We have this array. We can see that one is at index of zero and we need to return the index. Now, a simple approach to solving this problem would be to iterate through using some kind of for loop, all the values. And once we find our target, we can return its index. But the problem with that is say one was at the end here. We'd have to iterate through all of these values in order to return one. And that would be O of N, where N is the length of the input array. 
So like we said before, this is going to be scaling in a linear fashion. So as this input size increases, so say it's times by a thousand and one is at the end of that array, the time taken to perform the operation and return the index is going to increase linearly with the size of the input. So we need a more optimal solution. And what we can do is because this array is sorted is we can use something called binary search. And what binary search does is it splits this array in half. So we're going to take a left pointer, a right pointer, and the mid. Let me write this down. Left, right, and mid. Now, what we're going to check, and this can only be carried out when the array is sorted, we're going to check if the value at mid is greater than the target. We can see that it's four, so it is greater than target. So what we're going to do is we're going to move right to mid minus one. So right's going to move here. Mid is now going to be updated to here. And then we're going to repeat the process. So we can see that mid is still greater than the target. So at this point, we can say right is mid minus one. And as long as left is less than right, we can carry out these processes. But now left and right are at the same point. There is no need for mid. We can just return the index now. So let's break down the time complexity. We start off with n values, right? So this is equal to eight elements. Then we split it in half and we have four elements, then two, and then we finish off with our value. n is equal to eight here. Then we go down to four, then two, then n is equal to one. So how many times have we divided eight by two in order to get to one? Well, that's one, two, three. So we divided eight by two, three times in order to get to one. And this can be expressed by log base two of n is equal to x. So we have log two, and in this case is the number of elements, which is eight. And we have divided eight by two, three times in total to get the value of one. Two is the base, so it's the value we're dividing eight by in order to reach one. And three is the number of times we divide by in order to get to one. And because we're using big O notation, we can drop this constant. So we're left with log of eight, which can be simplified to log of n. So let's quickly look at the code of the binary search so you can understand exactly how this was formed. So we have two parameters within this binary search function. We have array and target. We initialize two pointers. So we have the left point, which is initially set at index of zero. And we have the right pointer, which is set at the last value within the array. Then we have this condition. So our left is less than or equal to right. We're going to carry out this logic. So we calculate the mid, then we check if the value at mid is equal to the target. If it is, we have found the value. So we can return the index, which is mid. If array at mid is less than the target, well, we need to update left and left is going to be mid plus one. So we remove half of the search criteria. We remove half of the array. Otherwise we do the opposite and we update right to mid minus one, again, removing half of the array. And here we are just returning minus one. In the case that the target value is not found within the sorted array, we are going to return minus one. So that's O log N. Let's now move our focus to N log N. Through the function kth largest element, which takes in an array and a value of k. And all we need to return is kth largest value. So it's going to be the second largest value within this array. So we can see from looking at this that it's going to be 29. Firstly, we've sorted the array in descending order. Then we're just accessing k minus one because we're zero indexed here. We're accessing this element within the array. So let's break down the time complexity of this. Firstly, let's look at the return statement. We are returning a value within the array, which we're accessing via its index. And we know that accessing a value within an array by its index is considered a one because this is stored as a contiguous block of elements. So very fast. The tricky part is this sort here. This sort is considered to be n times log n complexity. Now, why is this? Well, let's break it down. So in JavaScript, the sort method is not guaranteed to be stable, but it's said to use a variation of Tim sort. Now Tim sort uses the divide and conquer approach similar to merge sort. So let's break this down step by step. So initially we have the array. The first step that Tim sort carries out is it uses insertion sort to create runs. So for simplicity's sake, let's say we break this array down. So we divide it into eight runs. Now that we've divided it into the individual eight runs, we can start conquering, right? So we can merge these. So as you can see, 29 and 10 have been merged and sorted. 14 and 37 are in the correct order. 13 and seven have been sorted and merged. And then 18 and 24 are already in the correct order. And then we repeat this process. We sort and we merge, sort and merge until we have sorted the entire array. Now, the initial process of converting this array into these eight runs is going to take linear time because we are iterating through each and every single one of these values within the array. So this part of TimSort is O of n. Now the conquering section, well, how many times do we have to divide eight runs by in order to get the last run? Well, similar to the last solution we had, we go from eight runs to four runs to two runs to one run. Now, what is that? That's one, that's two, that's three times. And just like before, this is expressed log base two of eight, which is equal to three. So eight is the initial runs, two is what we're dividing eight by, and three is the number of steps it takes us to divide eight by two in order to get to one. Two is a constant, so we can remove that. And this can be simplified to log n, leaving us with the time complexity of n 
log n. Next up on the list of time complexities to look at is on squared, the quadratic time complexity. So let's break down this algorithm. This is bubble sort again. Now we've already looked at this, but let's look at the code. So bubble sort is passed in the argument containing this array. Now what we do within the algorithm is we loop through from the first position, we loop through the nums array, and we're only going to the last element minus one. And the reason for that is the next for loop is going to be going up to the last value. So we're always taking adjacent values. And then if nums at j is greater than nums at j plus one, so adjacent values, then we're going to use array destructuring to flip these values. And finally, we're going to return nums. Now, what is the time complexity of this? Well, let's break it down. The first for loop is iterating through nums. So we know that as nums increases, the time taken to complete this for loop is also going to increase. So that is going to be linear on. Now here's the tricky part. We have another for loop within this for loop. So for each value that this for loop reaches, we have to carry out the full iteration of nums through this for loop. So this is also O of n, where n is the input array of nums, but this needs to times this. So the overall time complexity for this is going to be O of n times n, which simplifies to O n squared, quadratic time complexity. So if we go back to the graph, as you can see, as the input size increases, the time taken for any algorithm that's running in on squared time complexity is going to be significantly more than say the linear time complexity. Right, so this is grossly inefficient in comparison to on. Now, whilst we're on nested for loops, we should take a look at this example. So we have print pairs. It's taking in array one and array two as arguments. We have the first for loop, which is iterating through array one elements. And then we have the nested for loop, which is iterating through array two elements. So pause the video, see if you can work out the time complexity for this. Okay, so let's break it down. We have the first for loop, which is iterating through all elements of array one. We can see that array one consists of integers one, two, and three. So this, this is going to be linear in regards to array one. So n is the length of the input array, array one. Now the second for loop iterates through array two and it does this for each value within array one. So this is a linear process, but it's going to be O of m time complexity, where m is the length of array two. So the overall time complexity here is going to be O of n times m. So it's not O n squared in this case, because we have two separate arrays that we are looping through. Okay, so next up, we have the super polynomial time complexities. So these are for harder questions. These are the brute force best solutions. So here we have the exponential time complexity. So two to the power of n. Okay, so let's take this as an example. We have the Fibonacci function, which takes in an integer. And then we have this clause here, which states that if n is less than or equal to one, we just want to return the value of n. Otherwise, we're going to return the recursive call, calling Fibonacci twice, passing in n minus one, and n minus two. So just for clarification, the Fibonacci sequence starts off with two values, zero and one, and then it's just the summation of these values to calculate the next value. So zero and one equals one, then one and one equals two, one plus two equals three, and so on. Now, because this is recursively calling the Fibonacci function twice, when we run this with the input of five, we get five back. Okay, now pay attention to how long it takes for this next one to run. We're gonna pass the value of 40 within the Fibonacci function. Let's save it, run it. Now, as you can see, there was a huge pause there before returning us the answer. And the reason for that is because the time complexity of this is exponential. Now let's break down what I mean by that. So for each Fibonacci function, when we're calculating the nth Fibonacci number, makes two recursive calls. So we call four and we call three. And then both of these make two recursive calls and so on and so forth. So for each call, it makes two more calls for itself. N minus one, N minus two. And as a result, the number of calls grow exponentially with n. Specifically, it grows in the manner that's proportional to two to the power of n, where two in this instance is the number of branches at each stage and n is considered the height of the tree. So for the Fibonacci to be calculated with the input value of five, it would be two to the power of five recursive function calls. Now say we did Fibonacci 35, that is gonna be two to the power of 35 function calls. So as you can see, the time complexity is going to grow exponentially. It's going to be a huge difference when the input size increases for the function. So it's important to note that this is not an efficient way to compute Fibonacci numbers due to the repeated calculations. So for example, we have Fibonacci three being counted here and here. We have two being counted here, 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 and we have one being calculated in multiple locations. A more efficient approach would be to use dynamic programming techniques such as bottom-up computation or memoization.
which can reduce this time complexity to a polynomial runtime of on. But we'll go into that later on in the course. Now decision trees could become even larger. Take for example, this recursive solution. So we have the four branch function, which again is having this break clause. So we are making four recursive calls per function and calling it with three is going to result in four to the power three, which is equal to 64 calls to the function giving us an overall time complexity four to the power of n, which is huge. So please bear in mind that when you're using recursion, you use it as efficiently as possible. And the last time complexity we are going to be considering is n factorial. So here we have generate permutation, which takes in a string. And all this function is doing is generating all the permutations of this string. So let me run this to show you what I mean. So as you can see, we've run this and we've calculated all the permutations of said string. So let's break down how this has been calculated. So looking at the decision tree of generating permutations, at the first stage, we have three characters to choose from. So there are three potential choices. So we can choose A, we can choose B, or we can choose the character C. Then at the next stage, there are two options to choose from, B or C. And lastly, there is one option to choose from, whether it's C or C or B, and then we're left with the permutations. So we have N options at this stage, N minus one, N minus two. So three options to begin with, then two options, then one option. And this can be simplified to three factorial, right? Because N times N minus one times N minus two, all the way to one equates to N factorial, which leads to this hefty factorial growth. Okay, so now that we've discussed some of the most common time complexities and how they are broken down, let's look at simplifying big O notation. So the first point is coefficients do not matter. So take for example, O to N. As we scale our algorithm, this coefficient here, this two is going to become less and less significant. So this can be simplified to O N. It's the same with six N, it's even the same with n divided by three because n divided by three simplifies to one divided by three times n. And this right here is the exact same as times n by two or times n by six. So it can be simplified to on. So that's the first case of simplifying big O. Coefficients do not matter. Next up, smaller terms do not matter. So take this as an example. We know that 100 is a constant, which will not scale as the input scales, so we can get rid of that. This 100 here is a coefficient, and we know as we scale, this becomes less and less significant, so we can remove that. Now we have n to the power of two plus n. Which one of these is going to scale more drastically when the input increases? It's going to be the n squared. So we can drop the non-dominant term which leaves us with the time complexity of O n squared, right? So when you're working out algorithms and their time complexities, always think about the worst case. So when we had n to the power of two and n, we know for a fact that as the input size increases, this is going to impact the efficiency of the algorithm more than this. So we drop the non-dominant term. Next is nested loops. So when looking at nested loops, multiply the complexities of each loop. We discussed this earlier, but it needs reiterating. So we have bubble sort, which is O n times n or n to the power of two, because we are looping through the nums array twice. And then with print pairs, we have a nested for loop again. But in this instance, we are looping through two different arrays. So we times those together. Okay, so that was a compact overview of some of the most common time complexities using big O notation, how we calculate it and how they relate to one another, which is essential when discerning the most optimal algorithms. So definitely a lot to take on board. So go back over the video, understand it and start implementing this knowledge. Hope you've enjoyed the video and I'll see you in the next one.